Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the high heaven. The Lord be with you. And also Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives that they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings from Holy Scripture. A reading from Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read responsibly by half verse, Psalm 133. Oh, how good and pleasant it is. When the brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head. That runs down on the beard. Upon the beard of Aaron. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing. Life forevermore. A reading from 1 John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, 
what we have looked at and touched with our hands. Concerning the word of life, this life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, 
peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So in this gospel story we hear today, the most important sentence is this one. You may have life in Jesus' name. You may have life in Jesus' name. When John talks about the miracle of Jesus' presence among the disciples, he wraps up his account with that sentence. You may have life in Jesus' name. Life. There's life and there is life, though, right? There's life that's mere sleepwalking through the world. Life that is ours simply because we were born and we exist in the world. But then there's another kind of life that Jesus is talking about. Something more than just existing. A life imbued with love, with peace, and with purpose. And there are days when we cannot imagine ourselves having that kind of life because the bare existence and how hard it is, the bare existence kind of life gets in the way. So what gets in the way of life? What causes us not to engage in this kind of life? Fear? Doubt? Distraction? Certainly, distraction is the easiest one to recognize. Cell phones, am I right? 
Do you see people who see, seem so attached to their smartphones that they do not see the world around them? Or if you're traveling somewhere wonderful where there's all sorts of gorgeous things to see, people are so busy trying to get the right photograph that they don't experience the thing itself, it drives me bonkers. And even if you go to a fancy restaurant, you will see people taking pictures of each entree as it comes out. I am guilty. There is a reason why there is now a saying says that your phone eats first. There are other kinds of distractions, too. Are there those among us that are so focused on what we don't have that we cannot see what we do have? I've been reading a book this week by Tracy Kidder, who's a wonderful author, nonfiction author, called Rough Sleepers, about folks who are experiencing homelessness in the Boston area and the program that was developed as an offshoot of Mass General Hospital uh, that ministers to those folks, the whole of those folks, not just the fact that they don't have a roof over their head because it's always more complicated than that. And many of the people who work on this project, it's been going on for maybe 30 years now, maybe longer, uh, say that it is hard, hard work but it's the most wonderful place that they have ever worked because there is such, such kindness offered. There is such a focus on caring for people whom society has deemed not worthy of care. And one of the reasons why they find it so wonderful is because oftentimes the persons whom they serve themselves will say, this place is the best, it is so wonderful, you are so kind, and I'm so grateful. These people who have nothing but a couple of garbage bags full of belongings, they talk about the care that is shown to them rather than what they lack. What about fear? What about doubt? Immediately before this passage in the Gospel of John, we hear of Mary Magdalene's encounter with Jesus outside the tomb when she is surprised by a stranger whom she doesn't recognize until he says her name. It is the Lord. It is Jesus. It is only when she hears him say, Mary, that she realizes she runs back and tells the other disciples who are locked in that upper room, we do not hear in the Gospel of John whether or not they believed her. I find it fascinating that the first people who encounter the risen Jesus are the women. We do not hear if they believed her because then we have a repeat of what happened to her. Jesus shows up in that upper room. He's showing the disciples he's risen, just as he showed Mary Magdalene he was risen. He's showing them what life looks like, right? He goes to where those who need him are. He doesn't just wait for them to come to him. Rather like the folks in that project in Boston who have street teams and street fans that go out to minister to folks where they are sleeping rough, where they are sleeping in doorways, in alleyways, in corners where they, where they feel safe. He goes to where they need to see him and hear him. And later, after Thomas expresses his doubt in his fellow disciples' report, Jesus comes again because Thomas needs him. And Thomas confirms this strange and miraculous thing. And Thomas and the rest of us can live that kind of Jesus life because of the promise of this. Jesus shows up. 
Jesus shows up when we're filled with doubt, either self-doubt or doubt of Jesus loving us or trusting us. Jesus shows up when we're afraid and our spines are getting weak. He stands behind us and props us up. Jesus shows up when we're distracted by what we see on Facebook or the news reports and have forgotten that he is our strength and our salvation. Jesus shows up when we are stuck in an endless loop of dealing with all the stuff that fills our days. And we need to be reminded about what's important and what's not important. And even when we're being like Eeyore and being rather whiny and complaining, I preach to myself here, when we're dealing with all of the stuff that fills our days, when we need to be reminded about all of this, Jesus shows up just as he showed up when Thomas needed to see him. Jesus shows up, and that can give us the strength and the courage and the persistence to show up for Jesus, to live the Jesus life, a life filled with love and peace and purpose despite all that tries to draw us away from that life. And Jesus showing up did something for Thomas, not just confirming what the fellow disciples said. Here's the rest of the story. He is believed to have become a missionary to India, where he established a community of faithful Christ followers along the Malabar coast, in 52 A.D., long long before any of us of European ancestry, any of our forebears had any idea that there was this guy called Jesus Christ. Today, those followers who are called Martoma, St. Thomas Christians, number over 1.2 million. They are in communion with the Anglican communion and with the Episcopal Church in America. I have many friends who are from the Martoma tradition who have become Episcopal priests. Thomas. Thomas gets that bad rap of just being named Doubting Thomas. We know so little about him, and yet he was so meaningful because Jesus showed up. His work was not bad for someone who had doubts and needed real proof, not bad for someone who wondered if Jesus really showed up, perhaps when he realized that Jesus Christ really does show up. It gave him the courage and the strength and the perseverance to live the Jesus life, sharing Jesus' words in very far away places. Not all of us are called to travel far to share the Jesus life. But we can live that life here too. Every time we encounter someone who is in need of feeling Jesus' presence, you can be a conduit of Jesus' love to that person. And so perhaps we can have the courage and the strength and the perseverance to live the Jesus life too, as our friends in Boston are doing for people without housing there, knowing that Jesus will always show up for us when we need him. He will always always show up.
standing or kneeling, join in the prayers of the people. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. In our parish cycle of prayer, we remember the Williams, Williamson, and Wilson families, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community and the nation and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. We remember those who desire healing in body or spirit. We especially pray for Joy, Roger, Guy, Brooke, Chris, Sydney, Texie, Nick, Sarah, Bill, Bob, Danny, Jim, Christine, Laura, Leslie, Bill, Bill, Ted, and Bill. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, and Susan, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God and his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, I invite you to add your own petitions, either silently or aloud. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. I invite you to add your own thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. The batteries died. That should work now. Technology, ain't it grand? So please do enjoy some coffee or a cool drink and some snacks after church. Search committee will be meeting after church for a little bit. There will be our normal Tuesday Eucharist at noontime. Please do feel free to join us for that. It is quiet, it is contemplative, it is relatively brief. My sermon is certainly shorter. And all are welcome to this particular community 
of shared love and prayer and worship. Uh, let's see. I wanted to remind you that vestry meetings are now going to be on the third Sunday of every month after church. So that means next Sunday after church. Louis, you and I need to get together sometime this week to chat about that. This is the first Sunday. You're right, the 21st. Uh, age. Between technology and age, it's a miracle that I get through this thing. Thank you, Lord, for your patience with me, and thank you for your patience. Uh, it is a gorgeous day. As you pray for things, say a thank you prayer for all those who help make growing things beautiful. Certainly, we are blessed with Crystal McBee, which helps out with, who helps out with our garden, and Kathy and Rick Talmadge, who take the lead on the outreach garden. God has given us these gifts and we should be thankful for them. Any other things that we need to announce today? Anybody have anything in mind? By the way, you know the window project, they will be starting shortly, in a few weeks, to start doing that work. Louis, do you want to talk to that, or Marwe, you want to talk to that at all? We're excited about the beginning of that. We received a very generous check from the Cameron Foundation to help with the costs of that. And we are grateful that we are able to do this thing to restore something that is so beautiful in our church. And now we come to the time when we give a little back, back to God. God who has given us so much. This beautiful space, our wonderful companions in this work, those who are part of our community and attached to us in various and sundry ways. What you give supports our work to support what we do within these walls and outside these walls to help make the world a little closer to what God made it to be. And so ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings and come into his courts.
The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we wait his resurrection glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, 
that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
And now in thanksgiving, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And continuing with the prayer for our search process. Come, Holy Spirit, open our ears to hear your quiet whispers, our eyes to see clearly the challenges and possibilities before us, and our hearts to feel your loving presence. Guide us in this search process so that we may seek to do your will. Bestow upon us the gifts we need to do the job that has been set before us. Hear our prayers, O Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I ask God's blessing in this Easter season when we celebrate our risen Lord, the gift of his heavenly Father. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon with you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.